Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the most interesting discussions that St. Augustine engages in, in his City of God, Book 19, has to do with peace and what we can call a universal and, and inexpungible desire for peace, even among those who seem to be opposed to it, those who don't want peace, those who are engaging in conflict. All of them, he says, actually do on some level and in some way desire peace. And often this means that they desire a peace in the way that they conceive of it as being good, even though it may not, in fact, be good in a full sense. So he tells us that every person, every human being, and as a matter of fact, he'll tell us that other animals too, every human being desires peace. So this raises a question right away. Well, what about those people who seem prone to conflict? Those who like to stir stuff up, those who seem to thrive on drama. And what Augustine says can apply just as well to them as to the people that he talks about who are a bit, little bit more familiar in his own time, those who wage war. He says that what they all really do desire is some kind of peace, but it's on their terms. So when a country wants to invade another country, as was happening with Rome all the time, or when there's civil war going on, or when there's barbarians invading and taking over, what is it that they really want? They want the things, perhaps, or they want to enjoy the activity of engaging in conflict. But what they ultimately want is for their needs to be met for them to get the other things that they desire and to be secure in them. You take over territory so that you can control that territory. Now you may do that by subordinating those people or as often happened in ancient times by taking the people off that land and sending them somewhere else and bringing in your own colonists. But the reason why you're doing that is so that you can have peace on your own terms. He also talks about those who are fighting as desiring peace with glory, with fame. You know, you might think of the Romans and uh, figures like Pompey, who you know, was just driven by the need for public honors that they called triumphs. Uh, you got those after the war was finished. And if you think about it in a much more mundane level, think about personal life, you know, the kind of people who, as we say, like to stir things up, what is it that they're actually doing? They're trying to bring about a new state of affairs that is more amenable to them. People engage in conflict because they want to produce a different kind of peace than whatever it is that they're currently within. So they desire peace on their own terms. And Augustine considers some other objections as well. You might say, well, that's Fine, but what about people who actually tear the fabric of society apart? What about, say, co-conspirators who are engaging in some sort of faction or revolution or plot? What about bands of criminals or pirates? There were pirates in his own time. Robbers, people who prey upon other people. And he says... Well, you're right. They are not respecting peace in society as such, 
but they do in fact still need to maintain peace among their own membership. So Augustine would say, yes, there does in fact have to be some honor among thieves if they're going to remain thieves very long. And insofar as the things break down between them, the relationships, the expectations, the structure of authority, they won't have peace and they won't be effective in order to actually be effective as some sort of organization, in order to impose force upon others and cause them to fear and give up their wallets or whatever it else it is that you're trying to get, their, their you know, money, their food, their liberty, anything it happens to be, you have to be able to unify. And you can only unify if there's some sort of lasting peace among the members. Once that disappears... They break down. And when we do see this, that one of the ways in which criminal organizations or uh, subversive organizations wind up being taken out is they get turned against each other. They come into conflict with each other. The peace ceases at that point. He says, what about, an? Uh, that's fine. Put that aside. Think about some guy who's so strong, so terrifying that he can do it all on his own. He's got no interest in lining up with any Confederates or associates. He's going to go out there and rape and murder and rob all by himself. Augustine says, well, even that guy is looking for some sort of shadow of peace insofar as he conceals his activity to any extent. He's trying to maintain some sort of peace between himself and the rest of the world. But let's assume that he doesn't do that. He, Augustine says, what happens when he goes home? Does he behave towards his wife and children in that very same way? Does he terrorize them? And Augustine says, well, maybe he does. But if he does that, it's because he is attempting to impose some sort of peace upon his own household. And he goes so far as to suggest that perhaps if, if an, uh, an individual like this were given an entire country to rule, he would rule it like his own household, that is badly and tyrannically, but with an, an effort and an intention of imposing some sort of peace on his own terms, some sort of harmony, what little harmony there can be with people who you've, you've made afraid of you through threats and force uh, and, and punishments and things like that. But there is still some vestige of peace there. Augustine then goes a little bit further. He says, now there isn't any actual person like this, but let's say that there was Something, let's do a thought experiment. There was some guy, we'll call him Kakos, which simply means the bad guy in ancient Greek, right? So he's just badness itself. He doesn't have a wife or kids. As a matter of fact, he doesn't even want that sort of thing. He just preys upon everybody he comes across. He's worse than the Cyclops of antiquity who at least had some sort of social life among them and perhaps their own wife and children that they would dominate, right? Kakos is just thoroughly bad. Augustine says, well, that guy still wants some kind of peace. He doesn't want peace with anybody else. As a matter of fact, he wants to kill them. But he does want peace with the members of his own body. He doesn't want his stomach not digesting the stuff that he puts in it. He wants his limbs to do the things that he wants them to do. You know, he could say the, the famous line, feet don't fail me now. Feet maintain peace by actually doing what it is that I tell you to do, right? Or he might say club hand don't fail me now as I'm clubbing somebody. We could go on and on. The point here is that even Kakos, who Augustine doesn't think really exists, but we might think there are some people that thoroughly bad, even he still wants to maintain some sort of integrity and some sort of harmony with some association, that of his bodily members. Now, Augustine does tell us a few other things about this notion of peace and our deep desire for it that are particularly important. And he talks about the difference between a just peace and an unjust peace. An unjust peace 
does involve trying to have peace on one's own terms. Peace that will seem peaceful for oneself, but will not seem peaceful for those who are subordinated, those who are exploited, those who are dominated, those who are in some way done in. But it, it, it does at least participate to some degree in what a just peace would look like, which would be an equitable distribution. Now, Augustine is talking within a Christian framework. So he, he thinks of this just peace ultimately in terms of an orientation towards uh, the divine, towards God, towards some sort of law or structure, a norm, uh, a moral structure under which everybody would live and under which everybody would get what they deserve and they would treat each other equitably. We have a wide range, of course, don't we, between the completely unjust, uh, which is almost a borderline condition that can't really exist, and the fully just, which would be uh, living within this divine arrangement. But we can have a just peace versus an unjust peace. Augustine tells us, that an unjust peace is driven and desired because of the vices of a person or persons. And he uses the example of pride, but we might be able to think of many others as well. You could take the seven deadly sins, which Augustine himself does not, of course, discuss in his works, but other Christian authors did and bring some of those in. Could we have people who attempt to impose an unjust peace because of the more bodily sins of lust or gluttony? Certainly. They, they attempt to maintain arrangements that fit them quite well. You might think of all the, the uh, revelations that have come about through the Me Too movement of horrible things that people have been doing for uh, decades and getting away with, driven by lust, perhaps also driven by pride and other things as well, but certainly uh, taking that form because of that, telling somebody that if they don't go along with you, because if they uh, reveal it, they'll be fired and sued, so they'd better get in line, you know, with, with the policies, never written policies, or even procure you further victims, that would be a perfect example of an unjust peace from Augustine's perspective. And it's driven by vices. Now, insofar as there's some sort of social arrangement being sought out, some sort of peace being produced, it's not completely bad because it's impossible for something to be thoroughly, completely no trace of good whatsoever. But the badness is parasitical upon the goodness in cases like this. And Augustine has a very nice passage here where he talks about the person who prefers what is right to what is wrong. Now that already excludes many people. There are many human beings in this world and there are many people in Augustine's own time who do in fact prefer what is wrong to what is right and may have told themselves that what they're preferring is actually right when it, indeed it is wrong. This is going on, you know, in pretty much every culture. <laughs> we look at their moral literature. So he says, he who prefers what is right to what is wrong. And then the, the next key phrase, what is well ordered to what is perverted. What he means there by perverted, we, we often think about this solely in a sexual context. When you see that term, you should think about its original meaning, turned away, turned aside, turned in the wrong direction. So what is good has been perverted or corrupted for something wrong, something evil. A person who prefers what is well-ordered, where things are actually given their right place and their proper orientations and placed into perspective with each other, as opposed to somebody who's driven by what is perverted, again, say, the desire to dominate others, will recognize, he says, that the peace of unjust men is not worthy to be called peace in comparison with the peace of the just, but even what is perverted must of necessity, he says, be in harmony with and in dependence on and in some part of the order of things, for otherwise it would have no existence at all. So what we find is that, that 
Everybody, every single thing, even animals. He talks about savage beasts, you know, at least taking care of their, their young and their own kind. Everything desires some sort of peace. But it's very easy to get mistaken about what a good, what a just, what a proper peace looks like. And instead to allow it to slip into a peace that we might find more congenial, but other beings won't because it's not a just peace. So Augustine wants us to recognize the difference between these and the fact that we could actually move from a desire for an unjust peace to a properly ordered desire for a just peace.